The King of New Orleans. By Greg Klein. Chapter 5. A Star is Born. A Star is Born. During the 1981-82 academic year, the New Orleans school system took a semi-formal survey of students, asking them which sports star they would most like to meet. When possible, the schools would try to bring that star in to speak to the children, and allow them to meet their hero. In the early 80s, the New Orleans Saints were a much less successful version of the Minnesota Vikings of the early NFL. The Vikings had made it to four Super Bowl games. Even though they had lost every one, their wild, talented quarterback, Fran Tarkington, became the face of the franchise, and was loved. The Saints wouldn't reach the Super Bowl until 2010. They had hardly ever made the playoffs, either. Mostly, they were bad, sometimes they were awful. The only thing they had going for them was their own beloved quarterback, Archie Manning. Manning is still a city hero and two of his sons, Peyton and Eli, have gone on to win Super Bowls. When they are not playing against the Saints, the Manning brothers are still the sentimental favorites in New Orleans, because they're Archie's boys. The local basketball star during that era had a nickname right out of wrestling. Pistol Pete Maravich broke or set nearly every basketball record at LSU. He doubled down on local hero cred when he went to the New Orleans Jazz, the city's NBA franchise at the time. It would have been natural for New Orleans kids to request a school visit from Manning or Maravich. Instead, most of them voted for someone else, a junkyard dog. This would come as a surprise to most of today's New Orleanians, Archie Manning is still an icon, probably more of a hero than in his playing days. Maravich died young, and is regarded as an all-time great the man who built LSU basketball. It may be hard to believe the junkyard dog could rival them in popularity, but it isn't unbelievable to those who were in New Orleans in the early 80s. The reality is, from 1980 to 1984, the junkyard dog was the biggest star in New Orleans. There's no proven formula for creating a star, despite what many in wrestling, or other forms of entertainment, believe. Wrestlers who were big in one territory often failed to get over elsewhere. Good booking and a hometown crowd have fooled many wrestlers, and rival promoters, into believing someone is better, or bigger, than they are. Bill Watts knew he had to be careful when he was creating his new headliner, and he tried to tightly control the circumstances of his rise to the top. I knew a black would draw blacks, Watts says in Sex, Lies, and Headlocks, but the real secret was not letting a white man save a black man. I put JYD in situations that were fucking impossible, and he always saved himself. And guess what? The whites loved him for it. Everyone loved him for it. He was a black man who was his own man. Of course he was also a pro wrestler and his every move, angle, and match was scripted or controlled from behind the curtain by an athletic Wizard of Oz. Many times, things went well for JYD, but occasionally they didn't, especially in the early days. At one point, while running a non-televised house show, Ernie Ladd booked JYD for a 20-minute match with a Super Destroyer to see what kind of stuff JYD had. Super D, real name Scott Irwin, had good working skills, but he couldn't carry JYD for 20 minutes. JYD blew up, that is, he ran out of breath, quickly. The match was awful. Ladd called Watts afterward and told him his plan wasn't going to fly, because your guy can't go. According to Watts, he nearly fired Ladd and Irwin that night. Watts told Ladd that he knew JYD's limitations. Their job wasn't to test him, their job was to protect him so his limitations were never visible. A similar thing happened at an early television taping in Shreveport against the masked grappler. Len Denton was from the same mold as a lot of JYD foes. He could work, he could talk, and he should have been the ideal guy to carry JYD to a good match. Apparently, however, he hadn't gotten the memo. As grappling was his gimmick, he took JYD down and kept him down, controlling him on the mat. Even with his high school wrestling background, JYD couldn't break free, and the match looked dismal and one-sided. Watts, who would become known for his ability to spin almost anything, couldn't find a way to explain the debacle. The match never aired. Even the initial characterization of the junkyard dog changed. When Ritter arrived from Calgary for his tryout all jacked up and athletic, Watts said he couldn't think of anything but Pat Crosh's song, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown. The song had already been used in wrestling. First, a man named Leroy Rochester took his wrestling name Leroy Brown, from it. Coincidentally, Ritter went by the ring name Leroy Rochester in one of his first stops in wrestling, Eastern Tennessee, when Watts heard the song, he focused the line in which Leroy Brown was called meaner than a junkyard dog. Simple as that, Mid-South's hero had a name. In the beginning, the character clung to the moniker quite literally. JYD rolled a wheelbarrow to the ring and played the role of a real-life junk man. 
Today the wheelbarrow would be filled with weapons, and he would use each one on his opponents, that was pretty much New Jack's gimmick in Extreme Championship Wrestling, ECW, 10 years later. For the Junkyard Dog and Mid-South, however, the initial gimmick didn't stick. Instead, a simple dog collar and chain would become JYD's trademark. With his gimmick established and his lack of working ability hidden, the character took off in the spring and summer of 1980. The Junkyard Dog's matches were quick affairs designed to make him look like a powerhouse. JYD doesn't get paid by the hour, Watts said so many times he could have trademarked the phrase. Indeed, almost all of JYD's matches, especially on television, clocked in at less than two minutes. Even when he faced top-flight opponents, JYD beat them quickly. That was part of his success. There would be a group of heels who were on top of the Federation, beating the other top babyfaces and causing trouble for the territory. Then JYD would come in and easily beat them all. Even when the heels successfully fought back, most likely by cheating, JYD overcame the odds. As Watts said, no one ever made the save for the junkyard dog, JYD always saved himself and any other good guy who needed saving. With this formula, Watts threw a steady rotation of heels to throw at JYD, then they'd leave town to get heat somewhere else. Of course it was standard procedure for any territory with an established local hero. Almost immediately, fans fell in love with JYD. I used to tease him, wrote his friend and running mate Ted DiBiase in his book, The Million Dollar Man, that I would wrestle an hour every night, getting paid peanuts, and he'd walk into the ring, shake his butt to the crowd, howl at the moon, work five minutes, and he was the highest paid guy in the territory. He would just laugh. The junkyard dog's popularity certainly met the expectations of Watts and his bookers. Mid-South, and in particular New Orleans, built arenas with black fans who were overjoyed to see a black star on top. Watts booked JYD very carefully, no one beat him in New Orleans, and his opponents rarely got one over on him. On the few occasions they did, it made for explosive rematches and even bigger crowds. It also made for dangerous nights for the heels who opposed him. Because of my feud with JYD, I had to be very careful, DBS he said. I was getting booed like never before and people literally wanted to kill me. Often, people tried. As mentioned, fans were known to throw rocks, bottles, and batteries, and attack cars as the heels left the arenas. After his heel turn, DBS he rode with someone else so the fans wouldn't destroy his car. On at least one occasion he rode with Grizzly Smith and someone slashed Smith's tires. In 1984, during the last Stampede feud, a preliminary wrestler, Tony Zane, got stabbed in New Orleans while he was going out for his match. When Jim Cornette heard this news, he tried to back out of his bout, screaming, they just stabbed one of the job guys, they're going to kill me. It wasn't just the fans who were dangerous. Mid-South had a reputation for being one of the worst territories for travel, because of the awful Oklahoma weather, ice in the winter, tornadoes all summer, the Gulf Coast hurricane season, and the thousands of miles of two-lane highways. The territory was also large, a weekly trip around the entire territory could mean racking up more than 2,000 miles. It was typical for the wrestlers to have to leave a show around 11 p.m., drive 350 miles to Shreveport, and then wake up the next day and drive another 350 miles to the next night's show. After that they often drove back to Shreveport to be in position to do it all over again the next day. On weekends, Watts booked two or occasionally three shows a day. Off days were rare, and injuries, which many wrestlers worked through, were common. True to his sense of discipline, Watts wouldn't let wrestlers leave matches when they were done working. Everyone left at the same time, after the main event. DBSE estimates that he drove about 60,000 miles a year in Mid-South, and that some of the guys, depending on where their home bases were, drove much further. The travel was so hard on family life that wrestlers, or their wives, often cracked. Twice DBSE fled for his home base of Georgia, where he could wrestle anywhere and be home the same night. Wrestlers in Mid-South spent little time at home unless they set up shop in Shreveport. Guys like DBSE and Butch Reed, who lived outside the territory altogether, spent no time at home. Reed ended up leaving, even though he was the star of the territory. The junkyard dog's second marriage eventually suffered, too, and in that respect he struggled to have a normal life as much as any of the other guys. However, in many ways he clearly had it much better. Where a preliminary guy might make $300 a week and subsist on what the boys called baloney blowouts, JYD made several thousand dollars a week, and that was just in average times. In the Freebird blowoff, he reportedly made $12,000, during the last stampede, he made even more. His weekly average as a main eventer was likely $3,000. His life at this point fell into a routine. He drove from town to town, wrestled, and partied. Everywhere he went, he was received as a hero.
Buddy Landell, who was a preliminary wrestler in Mid-South in 1982, lived next door to the junkyard dog and drove him around. Landell was moved by people's displays of affection for JYD. And JYD responded, Landell often tells stories of him giving money to people who were having trouble. White fans loved the junkyard dog, but clearly the idea of using a black star was an effective way to draw black fans. In New Orleans, the dog's yard, the nickname for the downtown municipal auditorium, was packed with black fans weekly. Other towns had a healthy mix of races, and when Mid-South added other young, good-looking baby faces in 1983, a mix of ages and sexes, as well. Wrestling served as a great melting pot in the South in much the same way sports did. Everyone could come together and cheer for the junkyard dog. But not everyone cheered. From the beginning, Watts had trouble with certain promoters who disliked the idea of a black star drawing black crowds while beating back every challenge the white heels threw at him. Much like Leroy McGurk, certain old-school elements in the South disliked having that many black fans in the audience. In Mississippi, and in particular in Louisiana, some of the old-line patronage appointees expressed their distaste for the way Watts was promoting his business. Watts's typical response was R-rated at best, and threatening at worst. In Louisiana, the Athletic Commission had set up a system that only allowed one to be licensed. Watts held the license, but to keep it he had to employ political appointees as his promoters in each city. Edwin Edwards, who was the Louisiana governor at the time, set up the commission as he set up all the state's business. His friends got money for little or no work, and in return they kicked some of that money back to Edwards's election fund. In most cases, the promoters didn't do any promoting for Watts. They just took their cut. Watts estimates that it cost him about $300,000 a year in payoffs. Ultimately, Edwards went to jail for taking these bribes, and it is only recently that he has been released from prison. In 1980, however, that didn't matter. The only thing that was relevant for Watts and Mid-South Wrestling was that they'd found their star. The Junkyard Dog had become one of the top names in all of wrestling. He not only headlined Mid-South, but made the rounds to the other territories for special events. He made frequent appearances on Georgia television for the cable powerhouse WTBS, which only increased his star power. In 1984, he even wrestled on the David Von Erich Memorial Show where Kerry Von Erich won the NWA world title from Ric Flair. In the ring, in the locker room, and in town after town, JYD showed his special charisma and his ability to connect with fans. With the help of Watts and Lad Smith, Buck Robley, Jim Ross, and the other talent in Mid-South, JYD became an icon, and his limitations were eclipsed by his popularity. It wouldn't always be that way. Later, Sylvester Ritter's demons would eclipse his wrestling success. However, in pro wrestling, the popular babyface is only half of the equation. To really make the matches and, for that matter, to really make the hero, Mid-South needed great heels. For Junkyard Dog, the promotion also needed guys who could work, who could run circles around the immobile star, draw out the action and carry him to good matches. They needed to be guys who could make JYD look like a superhero, while still keeping heat on themselves. For the fans, they needed hot angles. The free bird blinding gimmick worked wonders, but Watts knew he couldn't go to such extremes too often. Instead, he found an even better way to pop his crowds and put JYD in matches where he was constantly looking for revenge. In wrestling terms, it's called the turn or turning heel. One by one, the best workers in the Federation, the biggest stars, at times some of the biggest babyfaces, and for story purposes some of the junkyard dog's best friends, turned against him. Almost always the result was box office success.